Welcome, my friends. Edgar Von Gul is gone. I am Samael Rott. Welcome to my new show, The Grind, where we focus on the grindcore era, grindhouse movies from the 70s and 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm here in front of the Edwards Theater, which is closed down, but it used to be a mecca for people to go to because it was a cheaper theater. It was like $3 a head to get in. So it was a couple months after the movie came out that you were able to see it here. And this was before Netflix and Hulu and LimeWire and all that crap. So this is basically like what I'm going to do is talk to you about the Grindhouse, grindhouse era. The, the term Grindhouse originated in the 1930s because there was this guy named William Hayes. Hollywood had run amok. Those rapes, murders, there was all kinds of crap going on in Hollywood. And the rest of the world was like, clean up your shit. So they hired this guy named Hayes in, and what Hayes did was he developed a code. Movies couldn't have certain things, language, violence, sexuality. All these things were a boycott. You couldn't do any of them. I mean, even Gone with the Wind was banned in several states because of the, because whenever like the character said, I don't give a damn, they banned it in several states in 1939. So then that created the second era the second group of people, these carnival barkers on the underground market were making movies about sex and violence. And stuff like Maniac and Reaper Madness and all these different movies were coming out about the same time. So you had a choice. You're gonna go to this side of town and watch Young with the Wind, or you go to this side of town and watch Maniac. And a lot of people were there and the, the sexuality thing, there's also movies about where they actually showed women having, giving birth and having babies and they had sex acts and all these different things in these movies. And you would see these movies, most of them were done as sort of like cautionary tales for teenagers that showed the dangers of certain things like drugs and violence and sex. So then the term grind came out because it was like this, the grinding, the sexuality, everything. So then that came out into the 70s, which is where we're at now. This is my inaugural movie, this is the week before Christmas so I'm excited this is my Christmas movie it's called Silent Night Bloody Night it's the only movie I've ever seen where in the first 30 seconds you see a guy running around on fire <laughs> it's so awesome so anyway so this came out in 72 now the grindhouse the 70s grindhouse era which I love started because of people got tired of aliens and vampires and werewolves and zombies and stuff like that they wanted real monsters. So then the maniac craze started with movies like this and Black Christmas and Halloween and Texas Chainsaw Massacre and all this stuff came out from this era. And so this kind of falls in that. This came out in 72, a year before Texas Chainsaw Massacre and two years before Black Christmas and four years after that was Halloween, two years after that was Friday the 13th. So this is pretty much like the granddaddy of the slasher movement. It's got axe murders, blood, guts, all that stuff. So you're gonna have fun. So, what else am I gonna say? Steve, you know anything else I wanna add? I don't have anything to add. You don't have anything to add? All right. So without further ado, I will leave you to your viewing pleasure of Saturday Night Bloody Night, as I sit here at the beautiful theater. Keep it real.
One last time, I have to see this ground. It's beautiful now, as if nothing had happened here. Soon they will tear down the main house, and then nothing will be left. Nothing. Except what I remember. I grew up in the town nearby, where my father was the mayor, and where this house stood waiting for me. It was built by Wilfred Butler. We had never seen him, and he never lived at home. Until the day before Christmas in 1950, he finally did come back for the last time. us believe that his death was an accident. No one knew that another person had come to Butler House that Christmas. Deputy Coroner of the County of Arlington, State of Massachusetts. I hereby find upon evidence of an autopsy conducted by the medical examiner of this county that the deceased, Wilfred Butler, died as a result of burns inflicted accidentally upon himself on his own premises during the afternoon of December 24th, 1950. No further inquiry shall be held over the body of the deceased and this inquest is officially closed. Always calm, always bright, round yon virgin mother and child. After the coroner's inquest, on New Year's Day, they buried Wilfred Butler. There was no one there to mourn him. It was the funeral of a stranger. I 
I, Wilfred Butler, being of sound mind and body, at least what the world considers sound, do hereby leave my house and its grounds and all personal effects within that house to my only surviving relation, my grandson, Jeffrey Butler. And I solemnly charge him with one duty. Let him leave the house as I left it standing untouched to remind the world of its inhumanity and cruelty. For 20 years, that house lay empty, exactly as Wilfred left it. And then, last year, rumors began that it was finally being sold. The newspaper story traveled through the county to a state hospital for the criminally insane. The man who came to sell the house had never seen it. He was a lawyer from the city, just doing a job and enjoying it. Didn't I tell you? It's beautiful. Can we see the rest of it? <laughs> Honey, that was it. I think the mayor's waiting for me. My love is such an important man. Right. Laura always says that. 
darling. What? Don't be long. Honey, if you get bored, just look at the view. Sooner or later, that viaduct's gonna take us back home. Mr. Carter. Mr. Mayor. Let me introduce you. This is Charlie Toman, who publishes our weekly newspaper, The Patriot. Mr. Toman. Mm -hmm. And this is Tess Howard. How do you do? She operates our switchboard. Oh, really? We call her the communications director. And this is Bill Mason. Mason? Our sheriff. Won't you sit there, Mr. Carter? At the head of the table. Thank you. I, um, uh, I didn't expect to meet you all together. It's, it's quite a reception. Let's begin. As you know, I've been retained by Jeffrey Butler. The matter concerns the house that he inherited from his grandfather, Wilfred Butler. Go on, Mr. Carter. I, I believe that you offered to buy the house for my client. Offered? We begged him. We wrote letters That's and we... That's enough, Tess. Well, it's true. Trouble. It was always trouble. I can sympathize. I spent the last 20 years and more driving people away from there. Prowlers, burglars, kids, they're the worst. Chasing for nothing because of that will. That dribble about humanity. No, no, no. Inhumanity. What the hell is that, huh? Yes, well, he was a bitter man. Hate. It must have been very hard. It must have been hate. That man hated. Well, some people are like that. The question is, well, do you still want the house? Are you offering it to us, Mr. Carter? Exactly. Why now? Well, that's Mr. Butler's business, isn't it? You know we're not rich. Most of us came here during the Depression. But we love this town. It's our home. And naturally, you want to improve it. Exactly. My client understands that, and he fully sympathizes, and he's willing to sacrifice the house for $50,000 in cash by noon tomorrow. That's an awful lot of cash. 
It's also an awfully good bargain. You could go to Wilton. You could go now to the bank. Am I clearly understood? All that cash. Perfect. I'll wait for your answer till tomorrow. You're spending the night here? Yes. May I ask where? At the Butler House. We could put you up at the motel as our guest. No, no, the house is fine. The Paradise Motel. That's very kind of you, but I'm, I'm meeting Mr. Butler about some uh, personal items. You want a phone. I can reconnect the line. D don't trouble, please. No trouble. You need a phone. Don't want to be stuck out there. Mm -hmm. Well, you've uh, convinced me. Thank you. By the way, have you known Mr. Butler a long time? No, I've never met him. He called me and asked me if I'd handle this for him. I said yes. He had the key delivered to my office. Mr. Mayor. Sheriff, Mr. Tolman, Ms. Howard, see you all tomorrow. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> slick, really slick. He's a big lawyer, Bill. You've got to expect that. Don't tell me about lawyers. Oh, you see the way he looked at us? You see his clothes? He's doing his job. Just don't tell me about lawyers. You know what I like to see? Two of them like that when talking to each other. Neither one of them would know what to believe. I love you too. Only when I get home, I'm gonna have a nice, nice surprise for you. Oh, no, I can't tell you what it is now. It wouldn't be a surprise, now would it? No, no, I can't come home now, but it'll be very soon. Very soon. Co Honey, of course I miss you. Yes, yes, I... I miss mommy, too. Uh, Laura, how are you, kid? So, I'll call tomorrow. Uh, no, I want to call. I want to talk to Jenny. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, I'm, uh, I'm having a fine time. Well, same to you, darling. What do you mean, hostile? I was wondering, if we get it, what then? It's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Butler wasn't kidding. Nobody's lived here for years. That would be such a waste. It's his grandfather's monument. You know, the caretaker who keeps this place just the way he left it. 
What kind of monument is this? <laughs> well, that's the trouble. Nobody remembers anymore. That's what usually happens in America. I remember this. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I'm his own. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share must be there. <laughs> You're not serious. He used to hear that at funerals. At funerals? Yes. When I was a kid in Chipley, Georgia. There's also a Chipley flower, though. But they have both been subsequently eradicated from the map. was a delicatessen, so I brought you pastrami, salami, potato salad, macaroni, everything you like. I'll have bologna and macaroni. No, 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 some of that potato salad. Did you pick the wine, too? The delicatessen man took a personal interest in its selection. Oh, well, we got lucky again. That's early 1970. That's hard to come by. Can I have some, too? Of course, of course you may. Mmm, thank you. Underneath that wood, there's two feet of stone. The foundation is eight bricks wide. Now, someday, they're going to come in here, and they're going to tear this place down, and they're going to build little tract houses all over this property on quarter-acre and half-acre lots. And that bulldozer is going to come up that hill toward this house. And it's going to get the surprise of its life. They built a kingdom out here. Only nobody's left. No? Butler has a grandson. No, no. Well, he's probably like the rest of us. Wants money. You know, he's asking $50,000 cash for this place, and if he only where he can get, or he can get at least $250,000. But he won't take his time. So he'll get screwed. Do you want to go upstairs now? So. You know, one of the great pleasures in life is the pleasure of anticipating pleasure, isn't it? We are very close now, aren't we? Sure, honey. Very close. I don't see any beds yet. Well, keep looking, honey. Butler said the place is furnished. It's furnished. Anything doing? No, sir. But look at this. 
More football, huh? Look how they smeared that quarterback. Look at his arm. Got no time now. Otis. How about that telephone up at the Butler house? Is it working? Well, try it now. I'll wait. Hello? Oh, yes, Miss Howard. Yeah, the phone's working fine. Uh, very nice of you to go. Thank you. Good night. Honey, I'm going down to the car to get some cigarettes. Be back in a minute. Okay. Don't get lonely. No, no. Your cigarettes? Yes, yes, I did. May I have one? Sure. Well, it's the most amazing thing. These cigarettes come in these very small packages these days. Oh, that's for me? Mm -hmm. Can I open it? Oh, no, no, no. Our Christmas is day after tomorrow. Is that an order? Yes, ma'am, that's an order.
Uh, Bill, someone's calling from Butler House. Okay, put them on. Go ahead now. Mr. Carter? I'm not clear. Who is this? The owner. Butler. I'm worried, Cherish. Carter's not here. Speak up, I can't hear you. I can't. I'm sick. Can you come here? What is it? What's wrong? His car is here, but he's gone. Won't you come? Okay, okay. Now you stay put in that house. I'll wait for you. Please, hurry. I, I'm afraid. Now take it easy. I'm coming. Mr. Butler, are you done? Tess, I have come back. What's that? Tess, I want to see you again. Hello? Who is this? You know me, Tess. It's Mary Ann. Tell the mayor. Tell them all. I'm waiting in my father's house. Tess. everybody. Hello? Oh, Maggie, thank goodness. What is it, Dad? Something's come up. Something urgent. Can you start early? Oh, honey, I'm watching TV. Maggie Daly, you get yourself a... Well, this is the middle of the movie. This is the part where we take a little break. They used to call these fright breaks back in the 50s. And William Castle would do these things where the movie got too scary. They, uh, they had the coward's corner, which is like this little section they go into and you hide where the movie was too scary for you. Like the 60s. I can go on and on about William Castle. He's one of my favorites because they had a lot of these guys who would do gimmicks. Like I was talking about before, like... The theaters used to be like a mecca for people, but then the TV came along, drive bins came along, the movie theaters like this started dying. So they would do gimmicks. They'd do like insurance policy if you die of fright, fear burial, fright pills. They had let you this the seat so if you sit down, you get shocked. Or they have like a skeleton come out, or they had like these windshield wiper things that come out and make it feel like there's bugs crawling on your feet. All kinds of stuff. So it's pretty cool. So, they, so anyway, so the movie itself to me is fun because as you talk about Christmas, Christmas is a, this is gonna. Oh, I forgot. What's the important thing? It's mail time. I have a letter from a fan. This is Christopher Dabrowski from New York City, New York, and he gave him his cool letter. And he's talking about this show. The old show did Dead End Driving. He did one of these before for Midnight Chillers. And this is exciting. He does this full drawing here. He's amazing. And he does this for other horror fans. This is a whole community of us out there. And they have loyal fans like Chris here. Chris, I love you. I'm going to get those autographed pictures to you soon. You're going to love it. This is so cool. You got a, you got a close up of this, Steven? Good. This is so beautiful. I love hearing from my fans. So if you are a fan, email me at edgarvonrule at gmail.com. 
put the email address at the bottom of the screen. There's that one, and there's ReggieWalsh13 at gmail.com. I have two of them. I check them all, all the time. So if you if you want to get into talk with me, then I'll give you my private email, my private mailing address. If you want to send a physical letter, if you want to send like a fan mail or whatever, just let me know. I would love to hear from fans. I love it. So anyway, so the movie Saturday Night Bloody Night gets confused with Saturday Night Deadly Night, which was came out in '86, like almost 10, 15 years later. This one, Saturday Night Deadly Night, was the one with the killer Santa Claus that got boycotted by all these different people who were trying to say, You're killing Christmas, but I had Santa Claus be a killer. And then I didn't even see the movie, they just saw the trailer. Which a lot happens a lot. People just see the trailer for a movie and then go ape shit and just start going off and saying, like, Oh my god, this is horrible, this is the worst movie ever made, this is gonna. When it's not, <laughs> anything like that. It's, a, it's weird. But anyway, so this one. Is less about Christmas. This is more one of the movies where it's like escape mental patient rampage, which was a big thing back in the seventies. They had a lot of movies about people escaping from mental institutions, going on rampages, and killing people, which never happened in real life. Most mental patients escape just want to escape and go live their life. They don't want to go out on a rampage or killing people. The ones who are that dangerous they won't even get a chance to get out. Most of the ones who do get out are just regular schizophrenics who just want to get away from the hospital. I don't know. But well, it's a cool idea. I mean, serial killers are kind of like the modern version of monsters because before you had vampires and witches and werewolves and all that, demons, all that. Now you have human monsters because monsters, human monsters are a lot scarier, which goes back into what I was talking about earlier. Which was the yeah the idea that in the early '70s, this one and I Drink Your Blood were the first ones to really do this, which was get rid of the aliens. They they said I don't want aliens, I don't want monsters, I don't want zombies, I want real monsters, human monsters. So you get this, you get escape mental patients. So I hope you guys are enjoying so far. I mean, I haven't even talked about John Kerry and the muteness. That's one of the funny things when I watch this movie is like John Carradine's in it. He doesn't have any lines. He just rings a bell whenever he's trying to say something. <laughs> I can go on and on. But anyway, so I think I'm burning up enough tape. So we're going to go back to the movie and I'll see you at the end. So in the meantime, rock on, my brothers. Over here. Just get moving, Maggie. Just please hurry. Okay, mister, that's far enough. What do you want here? Mayor. Try again. My father's not home. And don't move. You want me to put my hands up? No. Just stay there. What are you staring at? I seem to remember you from the road. That's why I'm holding a gun. You scare me. 
If that makes sense. Thanks. Does everybody carry one here? You can ask the sheriff when he gets here. I'll call him. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the, uh, the sheriff's office is empty. How do you know? I was just there. Who are you? A Jeffrey Butler. Oh, you're the one who's selling the house? Yes. Have you any ID? Come on. Don't laugh at me. I want your ID. Some maniac escaped from Margaretville. Okay. Put it on the table. Now go back. California license. Lucky you. Would you like to see my maniac card from the asylum? They give you one when you escape. There's a big scarlet M on it so people won't get confused. Okay. Look, I'm sorry about the gun. My father's in Wilton getting your money. All I want to do is to get into my house. The sheriff's deputy might have a key. He's about the only one I know of. Well, where is he? You go down the road about a mile and a half till you come to a white house with a white fence, and then you can't miss it. Thanks. That's okay. Merry Christmas. Same to you. If I don't call back in an hour... What? Call the mayor or Mr. Tolan and nobody else. Promise me you'll do that. Well, sure. Mark it down, honey, so you'll have it. Sheriff to 301. I'm heading west on Route 5 to Butler House. You'll hear from me. What the hell? that light out there. Did you find the deputy? No, I wasn't there. Oh. I was thinking, isn't your lawyer supposed to be at the house? The door was locked. His car was there, so I borrowed it. You mean you stole a car? Yeah. Uh, keeping it warm. What if he needs it? Let him find me. Who's coming to dinner? Oh, Daddy. We always have dinner every Thursday. Do you want something? No, I hate the uh, Paradise Motel. Yeah, I know. It's awful. What about a drink? Yeah. 
It's uh, cheap bourbon, but that's a big favorite around here. Do you want ice? No, straight. You look tired. I am tired. Well, here's to a fast dollar. Cheers. Why did you decide to sell the house? Needed the cash. After all these years? I need it now. Huh. What's it like on the inside? You know, I've never seen the inside. When I was a child, my father told me to stay away from it or something terrible might happen. Sort of like a haunted house. I haven't seen it either. You're going to sell it? You've never seen it? Yeah. I don't know. It's too bad. It's about the only place to see around here. Oh, I forgot. Someone keeps calling with a message for my father. She says that she's waiting at your house. In the reception room. What woman is waiting in my house in the reception room? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's not a voice that I know. I better go out there. Can I come too? What for? I'm pushy. I suppose you'll be going back to California soon. Hmm? California. You said you lived there, remember? No, I'll be traveling. Jeff, look. It's the sheriff's car. That tombstone. Pretty cheerful. Who bears the cross shall wear the crown. Wilfred Butler. My grandfather. Oh. <gasps> Someone left their sunglasses in the snow. They're the sheriffs. My lawyer's missing. So is the sheriff. You've got strange phone calls. And now someone's fascinated by my grandfather's grave. Let's get out of here. You still want to go to my house? Yes. But, but I don't want to go alone. Listen. I'm not nervous. Well, of course you're not. Oh, it's the cold. I'm shaking from it. Let's get out of here. We'll get help in town. It's 10 minutes drive. Night, Mr. Tillman. Have a nice holiday.
Deputy's not here, but Toman is. Who's Toman? Come on, you'll see. Mr. Toman, wait. No, please, I have to talk to you. I'm sorry, this is Jeffrey Butler. He's the one who's selling the house. He can't get inside the place. And my father's gone to Wilton. So we wondered... Mm -hmm. Anything wrong? He'll tell us. Tess... has gone to his house. Why would she go there? I don't know. Anyway, she won't get in. You say it's locked. He says she hates the place. Would you like to drive there? Diana could stay here, lock herself in. I need a key. Tess isn't here. Are you satisfied? She must have gone to my place. Well, why wouldn't she go there? She hates it. Maybe she went to see the woman who's there. Someone called the mayor's house before. Said she'd be waiting. What is it? Jeff? Hello? Is anybody there? Who is this? I'm Diane Adams. I spoke to you before.
Who are you? Hello? Hello? Sheriff, I saw your car. Bill, is that you? The person on the telephone said 1935, Christmas Eve. But that's not the beginning. In 1927, Butler House was restored by Wilfred Butler. After that, I find social notes, parties, nothing special. Then, in 1930, Butler's wife, Catherine, dies of tuberculosis. In August 1933, it starts. Wilfred Butler's daughter is cruelly attacked and raped. Her name is Mary Ann, the same name as the caller who left those messages tonight. She's 15 then. On May 2nd, 1934, Mary Ann Butler gives birth to a son, Jeffrey Butler. Jeff. Early in 1935, Butler House is turned over to a Dr. Robinson as an asylum for mental patients. And then Butler goes on to say that he has committed his own daughter. Mary Ann will live at the asylum. There's no end to this story. It's been carefully cut out of all the papers. 
Why would Toman do that? Tess has 40 bird cages. Toman is hysterical. Everybody's at my house but me. It's cold outside and you forgot to lock the door. Jack, how old are you? How old am I? You mean how many years have I lived? No. There's a lot in the paper about your family. I don't want to talk about my family. Wait a minute. There's a woman calling and she says her name is Mary Ann. That was your mother's name, wasn't it? My mother died in childbirth. That's when I started traveling. It's not what the papers say. What's your point? I just thought that you should read something for your own good. Nothing you could tell me about my past or future would be for my own good. Where is the paper? on the table. It's so stupid to lie. I missed the whole event. Jeff, maybe your mother's still alive. Maybe she's waiting for you at the house. I don't know. Come on. No more side trips. Let's go out there. Dead.
his hands. Somebody cut off his hands. You killed him. You killed Tolman. He's asking for help. You killed him. Get in the car. I write this knowing that no one shall ever see it. Not my beloved daughter, or even my grandson, Jeffrey. I write for myself in the hope of forgiveness, if that is still possible. And I write for you, Marianne, whose youth and innocence I have destroyed. By 1935, the doctors had treated my daughter for a year. I had believed they could cure her. The child, Jeffrey, was taken from us and sent to California. <laughs> I turned my house into an asylum. I brought doctors to live there. 
I welcomed other patients. Useless. All of it. I remembered what she had been. There was never a lovelier, happier child. Christmas of the first year, I knew that I must act, not for myself, but for my helpless child. Led him to create this institution. Our friend... I had no plan. All I knew was that I must take her from these men with their promises, their lies. Shall we? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, which nobody can deny, which nobody can deny, which nobody can deny, for he's a jolly good fellow. I knew that they would gorge themselves into a stupor that afternoon. It was their celebration. I expected no less. Since they had come into my house, they had acted as if they owned it. They had behaved like poor relations, half guilty, but finally unable to control their appetites. <laughs> and drank as they usually did. All the time, Robinson would smile and reassure me. They expected me to believe, because I had no choice. Wilfred, trust me. He really believed Marianne would be well. He saw a light. There is a light at the end of a long tunnel. Believe me. There is a light at the end of a long tunnel. Stay here, Doctor. I'll get more champagne. He was ready. I knew it. Drunk and fat and full of his own importance. I left then.
My cruelty to Marianne was inhuman. I know that. I had loved her. I had fathered our child, Jeffrey. I had brought her to this. But I swear that on that afternoon, all I wanted was to save my child. My hope was to get her away from that house, but also I wanted to set free those other wretches who had so long been abused by the doctors.
after the inmates started for the house, I went to get our car to take Marianne away. I do not know exactly when she slipped away from me. I assume that when they saw her in the dining room, the inmates believed her to be part of that household which they hated. And so, they killed her. Later, there was a celebration. And then most of the inmates fled, I don't know where. But I shall never forget what they did to my child. Since that Christmas, I have lived in prisons and asylums. Lived anonymously as an animal. I have wandered in bitterness until all seasons have become as one. And that is a season of vengeance. still alive. This is still his house. Your grandfather died in 1950. He was burned to death in this house. My grandfather poured gasoline over a squad we found here. The town wanted to believe he was dead. They still do. was an asylum. There was a massacre by the inmates. Tess, Toman, the sheriff. Your father. No. All inmates. They killed my mother in this room. Oh, <laughs> 
I spent that night weeping. By morning, there were no more tears. I know that my father and Jeffrey both thought they were shooting at killers, but they were simply the last victims in that house of victims. And now, a year later, they will tear down Wilfred Butler's monument. But they can never destroy my memories of what happened here. Well, that's the end of the show. A little loopy. Anyway, so the next show was Silent Night, Bloody Night. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned a valuable lesson about... I don't know what. <laughs> I don't know if you're supposed to learn a lesson from this movie or not. It's just a, it's a mindless slasher film. I got like, an axe chopping people up. <laughs> okay, so, is there a point to slasher films? I think the point... I love slasher films because they don't have a point. It's just, everybody, it's the fear of untimely death. It's the fear, that's what it is, it's about facing the fear of untimely death. That's why a lot of people love them, because it's about people are living their normal everyday lives, doing their own thing, all of a sudden something bad happens to them, so then they have to deal with death. Because most people don't really deal with death anymore. Back in the, up until like the beginning of the 20th century, people were like really, were involved in death. I mean, they would. The whole town would be involved if somebody dies. Nowadays, it's like they just kind of. And then you go to the funeral, and then you bury him, and then that's it. You don't have wakes or. It's kind of. A, it's a different time. People don't really see people die anymore, unless it's like. A, yep. That's what's crazy. So, but uh, like I said, that's what horror films do. They they give you a chance to experience things you can't experience anywhere else. Which is why I think like the Grindhouse era is the most exciting era for me, because it was that time before cable, before the internet, whenever all you had was like three channels, or a movie theater. So you go to the movie theater and then you go see something like Yosa Shiwa of the SS or like zombie flesh eaters, and then you're like. You're seeing stuff you can't see anywhere else, like boobs and blood and all this stuff. So it was a chance to see a different world. And then you had to go to the slummy part of towns and you had to deal with like all kinds of stuff. So that was a it was like a different time. So I want to focus on that era right now. So I hope you guys enjoyed my inaugural episode of The Grind. Merry Christmas to everybody. This is like my Christmas movie. My inaugural movie is going to be a Christmas movie. So every year I'm going to do a Christmas movie. <laughs> there you go. Find Nicole. Anyway, so next time we're going to play Frankenstein 80. So keep watching. I don't have a catchphrase yet. I don't, I don't think of one. So I just keep thinking. 
Rock on, my brothers and sisters. Rock on. Metal forever, horror forever. Bring on the bo boobs and blood. Uh -oh. Bye.